Hi, this is Lex, and welcome to the Fintech Blueprint. It's your podcast about fintech, decentralized finance, digital banking, investing, robo-advice, artificial intelligence, and all the other frontier technology that is transforming financial services. To get more content, like an illustrated transcript of this conversation in your inbox, subscribe at fintechblueprint.com. So without further delay, let's jump into today's episode. Max, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited about our conversation. Max is the CEO and founder of Finimize, which is one of the largest finance communities and footprints thinking about how to invest, how to do personal finance right, and how to do it bottoms up for the world. He's also got a whole bunch of experience across financial services that we'll probably touch on. But I wanted to kick off with a pretty broad question, which is community. What was your journey like towards thinking about community and creating business activities around it and really trying to understand what that is? So let me answer that in two parts. I think the first part is how did we come into the community game? And the second part is like, how do we think about community? Because for us, it was quite honestly never part of the business plan to build a community. It happened very naturally, very organically. And I think the reason why it happened is that we try to really seed the atmosphere and seed sort of the, the foundation for a community to develop. And the way that we did that was that we treated our early users as VIPs. So we really did anything that we could do to go above and beyond to make them feel special from just randomly sending them gifts to idolizing them in our newsletter and, and having one of our artists paint images of our users and then tell our user's story. and. What happened then was one day we decided we want to meet some of the people who read our newsletter because the newsletter is how we started. That was like our early product. Maybe if I can pause you and reshift the question a little bit, which is more about how you personally came through your career journey to Finimize. What is Finimize and sort of starting to kind of just pull on the threads of your personal experience towards founding the company and then what the company tried to accomplish. And we'll definitely get into what you started to describe about community building, but just a level set of what is Finimize and then how did you get to being an entrepreneur and taking this focus? So Finimize is the way I like to think of ourselves as a modern financial information platform and community. And so we think in the ecosystem for the retail investors, there's been a lot of innovation when it comes to infrastructure, tools, platforms from the likes of zero commission trading to fractional shares, et cetera, massively reduce the barriers of entry for a whole new generation of retail investors. But the missing puzzle piece to this day really is where do these people get quality information. The existing solutions today are prohibitively expensive. You're going to be paying hundreds, if not thousands of dollars a year to get access to quality investing information. And so people turn to free resources like Reddit, TikTok, YouTube, which have some high quality stuff, but also have a ton of noise and a ton of pseudo finance gurus. And we believe that there's a huge opportunity to build a modern financial information tool and platform. That's what we're doing. And how I got started is that I've always been an entrepreneur. I've uh, previously built and then sold one of the larger e-commerce businesses in Europe and started Finimize out of a very personal experience that I had been saving up some money and wasn't really sure what to do with my savings. And my experience when I went to go see a financial advisor was that I immediately recognized that they were trying to sell me their products. And I, I knew that wasn't the right solution for me. It wasn't a genuine advice that they're trying to give me. It was a sales pitch. And when I tried to educate and inform myself online, I found it really difficult to wrap my head around it. And uh, I ended up just asking friends of mine who were working in finance all the questions that I had and kept bumping into people, though, who were in the same boat as I was. So they had some savings, but they didn't have that community around them of people who could help empower them to make the right investment decision. That was the genesis moment for Finimize. And we since have been embarking on this mission where we want to empower people to become their own financial advisors by giving them access to the tools and information they need. That's fantastic. Yeah. So one of the pieces I, I'd love to pull out a little bit more is 
what behavioral commonalities or what attributes of target markets are intuitive to you. And in part, when you look at the investing audience, the traditional segmentation of people is that there are delegators who want to have their assets managed for them. And there's lots of things to say about whether that's a real category or not. Then there are self-directed investors who want to pull the trigger and make their own decisions. And then there are folks in between who might need local help or are event-driven. And I think it's very interesting how there's been a lot of kind of point solutions to get people to put money into products, but not necessarily to become better at the knowledge that they need. But before hopping into that, just to, to meditate on the e-commerce platform experience that you had, can you talk a little bit about the type of customer that business had and the type of growth that you experienced? and how you thought about growth there? The way that we started there was we, we started with a daily deal model, which I'm sure you remember sort of the Groupon days. That allowed us to grow really, really rapidly because it was a very appealing product and there was a lot of product-driven growth. And then that was sort of amplified through paid marketing, obviously. But that had just insane growth rates. And then we expanded very quickly, which in hindsight was a really smart move into proper e-commerce. And what I mean by that is having our own supply chain, having our own warehouse, having our own inventory and moving away from the coupon model and, and moving more towards a real retail model. And then that allowed us to grow even further because you're going to attract more people and actually you're able to build a really sustainable business around that. And so the company today is still running. It's based out of Zurich in Switzerland. It's one of the largest players there in the market. To your point, who are the core customers? pretty much everybody. And the reason why I say everybody is because we ended up serving 25% of all households. So 25% of all Swiss households were shopping with us. We had a higher brand awareness than British Airways. And so we were a very well-known brand, a big fish in a small but very wealthy pond. I think we were, ended up being one of the fast or the fastest growing startup out of Switzerland. So two questions for me coming out of that. The first is around learnings for growing that retail footprint. You know, you've mentioned kind of the marketing lever and you've mentioned price and discount. What were the things that really mattered for getting people to engage, you know, and sort of with the premise that there were millions of people that had very established demand for the product? What were the kind of the blitz scaling levers? Well, kind of like I said, it's, it's a product that had very, very large word of mouth factor built into it. I think anything when you build a product that gives the end user or the end consumer money back into their pocket is something that will have very, very fast growth because you would be able to get anything from 30 to 70% discounts on booking a trip or going to the hairdresser or whatever the offer was. And so because these discounts were so incredibly high, very unique in the market, that was part of the whole proposition, the product offering ultimately was really driving the growth, right? And so I think that's one of the learnings is like, you know, whenever you can put money back into people's wallets, that's going to be likely a very great word of mouth driver for you. Were there any metrics or any tools that you were using to watch customer conversations? Like, did you track virality? What tools were available to figure that out? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I think this was obviously a couple of years ago. And since then, a lot has evolved that, for example, we're doing differently with Finimize, but we were very, very data focused. We, from the early days, had a business intelligence team, built our own data warehouse, completely in-house custom. And as a result, we're able to really sort of understand what are some of the, the customer behaviors, both on the acquisition side, as well as once somebody has bought, how much do they buy? How, what's the average purchase per year? What's the LTV, et cetera. But I think, you know, at the, at the end of the day, the way that we track growth was very sort of standard, look at it on a, on a channel by channel basis, you know, how much is Google bringing us, how much is Facebook is bringing us, et cetera, and then understand what's the CAC that we're paying. And is that within the range that we're, that we're aiming for? Gotcha. I really like your insight about putting money into people's pockets. And I expect that'll come back in the conversation about what you're doing now and with Finimize. I wanted to kick on two frameworks and I wonder if they resonate or not. So the first is around certainty of demand, right? When you're building such a broad retail platform, on the other side of your business, you know that demand is there for the products that you're selecting to present to your customers. And for many startups, they go into places where the demand is uncertain or sometimes even non-existent. 
And it's it's sort of like this battle cry that you're trying to find product market fit because there's no market and your product is strange in some sense. Whereas you've built a very quickly growing business in part understanding where the demand was. Have you thought about that? Does that resonate? I think if I understand your question correctly, it's it's essentially, are you building a product category? Are you building a market or are you entering into an existing market and then trying to take market share away? Is that correct? I kind of think of it as you know, you're trying to build Twitter or you're trying to build a social media site when there's no social media or you're trying to build Coinbase when there is no crypto asset trading yet and you're kind of taking the leap of faith of like there will be a market if I build it versus what you seem to have done is really reverse engineer what clients want and give them something better. One is you take away market share out of an existing market and the other one is you're creating a market from scratch. The latter one is obviously much harder and when it came to the online retail business it was a bit of a mix. Obviously there is an existing retail business, an existing retail market. But I think back in the day, we created a sort of a sub-market, which is this whole market around coupons, right? That wasn't really a thing. And I think as a result, we were kind of in somewhere in the middle, which is probably a good place to be because it means that you're on the one side playing in a, in a market that has clear demand, but on the other side, it doesn't have a lot of competition yet. I think when it comes to Finimize, I would describe ourselves more as building a new product category. There isn't really anybody who's doing what we're doing. And so it's a lot harder to do that because there's much more customer education to be done, right? So in the examples that you gave with like a Twitter, back in the day when Jack Dorsey and Ev Williams and all those guys started Twitter, you know, it started as a text messaging service and people were really baffled by the idea of why would I ever want to broadcast where I am or what I'm doing via text message. And then obviously that moved on to coming a social media platform, etc. And so I think they really had to educate the market on, you know, what is the product? Why do we need it? How does it work, etc. Which from a personal point of view, I think is a much more exciting endeavor because you're genuinely building something new from scratch. But as I said, is, a, is obviously a much harder endeavor because you have way fewer proxies for demand. And you have to really, at the end of the day, have huge conviction in the vision of, of what you're building. So I think it's one of those things where like, you have to see the future today, and then you have to build towards that. And I think that's when you can, can genuinely create a market. Airbnb is another great example of that, right? They essentially created a market from scratch. So I think both can build really big businesses. And then I think it's a personal preference of, you know, are you going to iterate on something to make it better and take away market share? Or are you going to have a huge conviction play and start from something from scratch? Yep, makes sense. And the last piece I wanted to use as connective tissue is around the value chain. And so you've said that in the commerce example, you've thought through really building out not just customer acquisition, but kind of going into distribution and the full thing. When you look to add financial services in starting Finimize and thinking about where to add value, how did the financial product value chain appear to you? Is it similar to e-commerce? Is it comparable to e-commerce? What are your observations on manufacturing, supply chain, and distribution when it comes to financial services? Well, I, I think the value chain is fairly different in the sense that in retail, obviously, there's a lot of physical components, you know, from the actual goods and the actual warehouse, etc. And then the way I think about the financial space is that at the end of the day, it's an information economy. And, you know, whether that's payments or transfers that essentially are just sort of bits being transferred, information bits being transferred, or whether it's uh, getting access to knowledge, at the end of the day, it, it's an information game. I think in the finance space, there's a huge amount of information asymmetry, and that's what's creating a lot of opportunity. I think in the retail space, the big opportunity is all around convenience, and convenience for the end consumer is driven by operational excellence. So if you go into, an, into a retailer, you are very, very likely to hear the term operational excellence, because at the end of the day, it's all about optimizing the margins and then delivering on a customer promise. To give you an example for that is, and obviously Amazon is really at the forefront of all of this. It's all about, can I deliver a product to you faster than anybody else? You know, it used to be 
same week, then same day. Now it's the same hour. And then now you're having all these like online grocery players come into the market that say, hey, I'm going to deliver groceries to you in 10 minutes. And so that's the convenience element, but you need the operational excellence in order to actually uphold that promise. Number one, if you deliver within 10 minutes at scale, it starts to become operationally very complex. And then number two is, and that's in the example of the online grocery players, they haven't figured that part out is, you need to be able to build a business around that, right? So if you're losing money by offering convenience, uh, that's not how you build a business. And so then it becomes, okay, what can I do internally in order to to be as cost efficient as possible to deliver on the best customer experience? And so I think those are really the two paradigms there. That's interesting because I think it kind of echoes in your impression of a financial advisor trying to sell you things. And if you look at neobanks and robo-advisors and digital investing apps and so on, I would say the value proposition they come with is convenience and at least an attempt at operational excellence. The attributes of that are a little bit different. They're how fast do I open an account? Is it 20 screens in a month or a piece of paper? Or is it three screens and a machine vision scan of my face into a KYC vendor? If you think of that as downstream from knowledge, right? If you think of accounts, depository accounts or brokerage accounts where investment funds sit, that's kind of your factory. And then you've got a bunch of stuff connecting that to the various stores, the stores being today largely mobile apps, but in some cases still fortune that you had of talking to a person. There is this kind of analogy, I think, for building the thing, shipping the thing and getting it to a person, which I think all sits underneath what you're trying to accomplish with Finimize. So I had interrupted you now about 20 minutes ago describing how you started giving VIP treatment to certain members. How did that evolve? What role are you seeing Finimize play for people in that value chain and, and how do you see it evolving going forward? Yeah, and maybe I could just comment also on this analogy. I think it's an interesting analogy. I think I, what I would highlight though is that in the e-commerce or in the retail example, you are, as a company, you're trying to essentially create a new experience that is this convenience. I think in the finance example, it's, it's much more a question of removing friction and, and removing barriers, right? So like the fact that people are, can now trade at zero commission, that's not something that they essentially created out of scratch. What they did instead is they removed something, right? So, and so it's all about removing, removing, removing. And I think that's at the end of the day, this uh, information game where there are a lot of barriers, there are a lot of asymmetries, and it's all about removing friction. And so at the end of the day, the, the end consumer wins, and that's great. And I think that's sort of the the outcome of both of these examples. To your question on the community, so you asked me, you know, what, well, how do we think about community and how did it start? And so what I was saying is that we started with sort of laying the seeds there and what happened was when we went to go meet our users for the first time, we were very overwhelmed by how many people actually showed up. So we were meeting in a pub in East London and something like 50 people showed up and the entire pub was filled with Finimize users. And we said, hey, there's something interesting here. Why don't we do this again? And we next time there were like 80 and then like 100 and then 200 and then 300. And these things started to kind of blow up. And we then started to get messages from people all over the world, from Sydney to Los Angeles to Buenos Aires, where people were asking us, hey, you know, this looks really cool what you're doing in London. Can we do this in our cities as well? And at first we kind of said, oh, we'd love to, but unfortunately we can't fly around the world, even though that sounds like a really fun job. But why don't we create a playbook and then we empower our users to essentially become an extension of our brand to host these meetups all over the world. And so that then gave life to the community as it is today. And the way that we think about community is, and I think community is one of those words that gets thrown around very, very loosely. There's people or companies when they claim to have a community just because they have Facebook followers or just because they have a customer support forum. And I think that's not a community. I think there's a big distinction between broadcasting to an audience, which is what, for example, a large Facebook following might be. And then there's community where the actual value creation happens among the peers. So it's this like peer to peer notion, right? So the question is like, if tomorrow you were to stop doing what you're doing, 
would the community live on and would they continue to create value for each other without your brand being involved? And I think if the answer is yes, that's when you have a community. And if the answer is no, that's when you have an audience or a, or a fan base or a following. So what is the purpose of the Finimize community and how does the community relate back to Finimize in the sense of the business you're growing or the, you know, the mission of the organization? How, how do you see these two things connect? Yeah. So I think for us, there's really two pillars in what we're doing. The first pillar is that we have an in-house team of analysts who produce high quality content for the modern retail investor. And that's great. And that gives you a lot of ideas of how to think about your investments, etc. But what we found is that the modern retail investor is very, very, very community driven. So when we ask our audience and, and also when we look at other external research, we found that more than 90% consult their friends and peers when they make an investment decision. So that's massive, right? 90% consult their friends and peers when they make an investment decision. And so what we found was the insight that we got was that in order to really help people make smarter decisions with their money, you need to have a community that can help drive that decision and empower people to make smarter decisions. Similar to the example that I experienced where it's one thing to receive information. It's another thing to then have that support where you can ask people, hey, when you got into cryptocurrency for the first time, what exchange did you use? Why did you use that? How did you set it up? How did you think about identifying which cryptocurrency to invest in, et cetera? And so there's a certain element of trust because coming back to the example of me going to the financial advisor, other people within the community do not have any kind of hidden agenda or incentive to make you do something. They will tell you about their experiences and, and give you their learnings purely because they want to help you. And that's where the power is. This is like a, almost a therapy question, or I want to kind of really grok this, which is why do you think people want to help each other in this? What is going on? It's Everybody's busy. It's not true that we all want to go to a presentation on open banking APIs and how they connect into banks and how that's really great. There's something there about human nature and motivation, right? So what is the underlying sort of cause to to bubble up so much interest and so much of this congealing and coming together? Yeah, that's a good question. I think at the end of the day, what brings and holds a community together? And it's it's typically a shared purpose or a shared sense of belonging. And I think in our instance, uh, people really, really, really care about the mission of empowering people to become their own financial advisors. So what I was talking about, maybe just for context, with the meetups that happen all over the world, they're 100% organized by community members. So these are community hosts who apply to become a host, and they do this on a voluntary basis. We do not pay them. We don't give them any kind of rewards. They do this because they fundamentally believe in what we're doing. And I think as a result, people are really, really bought in to helping each other because the broader mission is so powerful. And I think another example sort of outside of Finimize is obviously what's, what's happened in the whole, I guess, meme stock world, right? Where people were holding and, and, and sticking together because uh, they had this shared sense of purpose that they felt like they were disadvantaged coming back to this whole information asymmetry problem in the finance space, they were on the on the losing end of this information asymmetry and they stuck together. And I think that's a that's a paradigm shift that we're witnessing in front of our own eyes right now that's that's happening and the information asymmetry is starting to level up. And that's what's so powerful. Great transition to the broader theme as well. And I'd love to figure out a way into that topic too, which is there is this power dynamic between I want to say the word the crowd, but it's not a it's not a good framing for it, you know, maybe between the population or the masses or in some way, it's the you know, the 1% versus the 99% or it is the experts versus common wisdom, some version of that. And this power asymmetry and the language of inequality and the slogans coming out of that have been shaking the world now for about a decade. And we're now in some of the most absurd representations of that struggle, where the world's richest man, Elon Musk, can role play somebody who is representing the, the common investor and is out there fighting for all of us 
and doing so by cheerleading Dogecoin, a meme cryptocurrency that even folks who are building cryptocurrencies don't necessarily see as the, the main vector forward and then have billions and billions of value created as a result of that dynamic. And, and that's just one slice. You know, The other slice being, of course, the tug of war between Reddit and the hedge funds on stocks like GME and AMC and so on. What do you make of that? What does this mean to you? So I think, first of all, the Elon Musk example, I think, is an interesting one, because I think at the end of the day, you could make an argument that he is <laughs> the biggest pump and dump master in the world. If you think about how he pumped up Bitcoin and then pumped it down, how he pumped up Dogecoin, pumped it down, how he's pumping up Tesla. And he's even saying, you know, it's overvalued now, et cetera. And so I think there's a certain, although I'm by no means a sort of anti-Tesla person, I think there's a certain skepticism with, with which we also need to view this, unfortunately. And I think, you know, also, if you think about some of the other guys who, who are sort of these let's call it fin Twitter influencers. I think like, for example, Chamath, right? Like he's obviously a very smart person. And if you think about it again, just sort of from more from a devil's advocate point of view, when the whole GME, et cetera, the whole meme stock phenomenon started, he very, very clearly positioned himself with what you described as the crowd, which is interesting. If you think about coming back to sort of agendas, he has a massive SPAC that he's I think now had, had one or two target companies go public with. And who are the people who are going to buy into this back? It's probably a large part of the so-called crowd. And so I think all of these people who are on Twitter, etc., who have established a huge following, by all means, you know, I think they, they might have genuine agendas and their views that they share might be very, very genuine. But you do always have to ask yourself, you know, what's the hidden agenda here of some of these people who, as you said, are among the richest people in the world. And I think that then is also reflected in, if you look at what's happened, I would say, for example, in this whole Reddit saga, there's like 10% of really smart, intelligent stuff that's being shared, but 90% that's noise. And I think a lot of this sort of fin twit influence stuff is, is also contributing to the noise and is making it harder to find the good stuff that's happening in the discussion. And then I guess the final piece is there's a lot of emotion that's been brought into the whole investing sphere, which is interesting, right? Because if you talk to anybody who, who knows a thing or two about finance, they'll tell you, you know, the number one thing is to take emotion out and establish a process and establish a framework and stick to that. Do not let emotion get into it. And what we're witnessing now is the complete opposite. People are so emotional that they're actually saying, I don't care what the outcome is. I just want to do this to prove a point. I don't have a view on whether that's going to stick around or, or whether that's a sort of phenomenon that's temporary. But I do think it's really interesting to see how that's been spreading so quickly. How do you think it could resolve? Are there ways that this energy dissipates and flows back into a more kind of conservative market structure? Or are we permanently in a high volume, lots of noise type of environment? You know, and I think for framing, I have two observations. The first is, it's not just fin Twitter now, right? Like it's fin talk. And if, if you think Twitter is bad, the stuff that's out on TikTok is is so topsy turvy and, and crazy. My career went through Lehman Brothers, and so looking at Fintag just gives me such deep PTSD that you wouldn't believe. No, I mean, I, I see this. It's like people who got a stimulus check and are leveraging it and then are putting it onto an altcoin that they have no clue what it actually does. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, we wanted to democratize financial services, and, and in some sense, here we are. You know, And then the, the other thread is also... If you look at the early 2000s, right, the Audis, is that there was this narrative of inevitability for passive investing and ETFs, and ETFs in large part ate up mutual funds and the 60-40 asset allocation became the norm. And if you talk to a lot of active managers, they are kind of terrified about fee compression and about indexing. And there was kind of this idea that active investing is dead. And yet two years ago, or maybe whatever it is, one year ago, you've got this huge rush of retail as we get locked down in COVID and go on Robin Hood and do nothing other than lever up options, right? And you've got this total kind of explosion between that and, and crypto assets. So how do we reconcile this? Where can it go? Yeah, I, I think that's the million dollar question right now. And the way I think about it is it's the sort of 10% substance, 90% noise. I think, yeah, as you mentioned, for example, on TikTok, I would probably say there's 99% noise. But I think a couple of things. I think number one, there's definitely been a paradigm shift. And the paradigm shift is away from passive investing 
more towards active investing. And, and personally, I think that's here to stay. And the reason is that there's been a mind shift that's been enabled by new tools, let's call it. And uh, specifically, I think fractional shares have played a huge role in this. So what we're seeing a lot with our members is people want to learn by doing. They are fed up with having to you know, spend years reading up on stuff. And then still, there's, there's always going to be a risk and a trade-off when you invest. And so what we're seeing a lot of is... Let's just jump in and learn by doing. And with fractional shares, you can do that. So people will buy into whether that's a meme stock or whether that's a growth stock or a value stock, doesn't matter. And they'll put like $100 into it. And they know that they're not going to get rich or poor as a result, but they have skin in the game and they're going to much more closely observe what's happening. And so they are learning by doing. And I think people want to take a more active role when it comes to their investments you know, for me also, it, it resonates. You've you've been working really hard to save up money and you want to have some sort of control over what you do, where you invest that money. And so I think this sort of purely passive investing, and, and I think you're starting to see that also with robo-advisors, I think people are, are over it. People don't want to just put your, your money into a robo-advisor and then they take a fee and you kind of hope that they do well, but in reality, they're probably going to do just as well if you would have put the money into a Vanguard ETF yourself. And so I think active is here to stay, at least for the for the coming years. Again, there might be a paradigm shift coming soon. I think the big question is what will happen when the party stops? And I think a lot of people are going to drop out of the market, but I think on a net basis, there's going to still be more retail investors that are going to stick around than there were before all of this happened. Yeah, the big question is going to be when things start going down, what happens? Who stays in? Are people going to be panic selling, etc.? And I think that's really when we're going to start to see the effects and the consequences of all of the events that we've been witnessing over the last couple of months. Yeah, I think there is also the simultaneous evolution of tech and media that's layered on top of that. So you know, we're all conditioned to be dopamine animals now, where the level of engagement we expect out of our products generally is so much higher in everything, right? So to your point about not only am I not going to go shopping to the mall, but I want it delivered to my house and I want it delivered today and I want it delivered in the next hour. And if you can give it to me in 15 minutes, then I'll choose you as a vendor. And then you go into the story for attention is at this point obvious. And then you go into finance, and I think this is the, the exact same dynamic where doing the thing that a doctor tells you is is neither interesting nor trusted, whereas holding the reins yourself, even if it's a dopamine game, is much more empowering or at least much more like all the other things that are happening around you. To use the casino as a comparison, and I don't mean like the casino in a gambling sense, but when you go to the casino, lots of people are there for primarily for entertainment right? Like you're, you're not there to win. <laughs> Statistically speaking, you're there to pay for the entertainment you're having. And so similarly, participation in a lot of the micro investing stuff, it's not clear that over the long run, it achieves the personal finance outcomes, but it definitely achieves the modern entertainment engagement outcomes the same way everything else does. Yeah, I guess that's the question, right? Like, I, I don't have the answer. I, I, I just have some, I guess, proxies for an answer because i think i wonder like out of all the people who've entered the market so i think last year alone in the us you had 10 million new retail investors enter the market then in q1 i, I saw that charles schwab announced uh, this year that they had more new accounts open than all of last year so there's even more acceleration and i wonder how many of those retail investors are doing what what you just described. And, you know, you have like a Dave Portnoy who from Barstool Sports, who very openly says like, hey, I'm now into investing because I can't do any sports betting right now. And so this is my form of entertainment on gambling, etc. But I wonder like out of out of those 10 million, are those 500,000? Are those a million? Are those 6 million people who are doing it? Because the research that I've read, I read a report from Edelman uh, and, and I think also from Charles Schwab and, and some of the other players. And also the research that we've done is like the average new retail investor is not the kid that you see on TikTok who's, uh, who just got a stimulus check and is 20 and is going to put it all in AMC or whatever. The average age of these people is, is 35 and they are just entering the market because they've saved enough money now and they have the tools and access now that they can invest the money. 
And so I think, and I, and I, and I can't prove this uh, right now, but I think the media narrative is not necessarily reflecting reality. I think the media narrative is very much focused on a small subset of people who are doing this gambling stuff. But I do think a large chunk of these new investors are actually doing so in, in a fairly reasonable manner. And again, I think you can do micro investing to entertain yourself, or you can do it to actually learn. And I wouldn't be surprised if quite a few people are in the latter camp of, of learning. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think just getting people out of cash and into into capital assets is already a really large improvement. So I want to close the loop with an earlier point you made about getting money to your community and to your customer is the best way to expand that footprint and grow that community. And when we combine the idea of a financial community with digital assets and crypto networks, my observation, this is exactly what is supercharging the people's passion about crypto assets in that if they participate early in a network, or sometimes if they use a network, they will literally get paid. They will literally have money in their pocket. It will it will come from the sky and land in their wallets, and they will have to pay income taxes on it. And I think that's, that's massively unique, right? We don't have in our sort of corporate structuring of financial services, businesses are oriented around closed loop economics for themselves. Whereas in the emerging kind of financial markets that are very community driven to be part of a community is to be rewarded in a very tangible sense. You know, I guess a, a two part question for you, which is, you know, generally, how do you think about that? What do, what do you think about that feedback loop? Does it, you know, does it resonate? And then the follow up would be is to bring it back to Finimize how you think about dynamics like that as they relate to what you're doing and how you think about putting that value back into your subscribers, your meetup and event attendees, and generally your community broadly. Yeah, I think I think a lot of really interesting stuff is happening there. And quite honestly, I'm still observing and learning because I think the emergence of NFTs, uh, the emergence of social tokens, I think that there's something really fascinating there. Personally, I'm not sure I've seen a use case yet where I, I feel like, okay, that's like a genuinely useful use case. I feel like it's just very early days, very much in the experimentation phase. And it's a sort of classic Silicon Valley notion of if something starts as a toy, it can still become a massively important tool later on and do not underestimate things that look like toys. And I, f I feel like that's very applicable to what we're witnessing right now with NFTs specifically. I think the question also when, when you connect that with community is at the end of the day, it's all around incentive structures, right? And I think the question is always, if you get people on board who are there because they want to get financial gain or a financial reward out of the relationship, you're probably going to attract the wrong people. We, for example, we've tried a while back, hey, what if we provide financial incentives, fiat currency though, uh, to people who are super active in our community or who host a lot of meetups, et cetera. And what we found is that you set the wrong incentives uh, and you attract the wrong people. And what you want in order for a community to thrive is you want to have people who deeply care about it and as a result are not motivated by money. I think what, what's interesting around all of these tokens, though, is that, and again, I haven't seen a use case where that's been done very well, but I'm sure at some point someone will do it, is, you know, can you attract those people without these wrong incentives? And can you position these tokens in a way that they aren't perhaps the primary driver, but are perhaps a retention driver or something like that, you know, where, where you're able to filter out the wrong people, quote unquote, and, uh, and still reward the right people, because you obviously do want to have people participate in the upside. If they are building your community, they should be rewarded as well. So I think there's a lot happening. There's a lot to unpack and super interesting. And, and one of those things where I, I think we'll see massive amount of iteration until we figure out what the right use cases are. Fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast and opening up these ideas with me. If folks want to learn more about the company and, and join what you're doing, where should they go? Yeah, thanks for having me. So you can find me personally on Twitter. Just type in my name, Max Rafaga, or my Twitter handle is Whole Earth Web. You can find the company on all social media, Finimize. You can sign up for a free newsletter on Finimize.com. Uh, it's completely free. Uh, and lastly, you can download our mobile apps on the App Store or Android Play Store. Cool. Thank you, Max. Thank you. 
Hi, everyone. That's it for this week's episode of the Fintech Blueprint. For more technical deep dives into all things fintech and decentralized finance, check out fintechblueprint.com and grab a free subscription to the newsletter. This is Lex, and I'll see you next time.